I want to talk a little bit about this particular group of men. You see, David was king of Israel, arguably the greatest king in Israel's history. Um, minus a couple of mistakes, but um, aside from that, he was the greatest king Israel had ever known, in my personal opinion. Um, David had a group of men, though. He had a group of men who were chosen as special warriors of his. These were a group of they were called the 30, which is a little bit of a misnomer. There were actually 37 of this in this group. Now, these were David's toughest warriors. These were the ones that you hear the legendary stories like, you did that? Um, th these weren't your average everyday soldiers. These were your special forces, your black ops, your Navy SEALs, that, that, those kind of people. A um, couple of examples you had. One, Josheb who killed 800 men in one battle with a spear. Uh, just him, right? Um, another one uh, was Eliezer. He was on the battlefield, and he kept killing Philistines until his hand was so sore that it stuck to his sword. Like, you couldn't get it off. Have you ever had your hands in a position for too long and you can't move? It was kind of that situation. Um, you had Abishai, who was the leader, and uh, he killed 300 men with one spear. Um, then you had uh, the Bible mentions, and in one particular story, three of these men, it doesn't mention their names, so they're kind of anonymous. Um, they, David mentioned that he wanted a drink of water from a particular well. Um, and he didn't ask anyone to go do it. But these three men heard him say that, man, I, I really want a drink from this particular well. So they went to that well, they got him a drink, and they brought it back. And, and they fought through. This, this, this was Philistine-controlled territory. They, they, they were in war. Right? This was no easy task. These three men, they snuck into enemy territory. They may have had to fight whoever they had to to get a drink and go back to them. These men, as it were, were the called, chosen, and faithful of David's military. Let's look in the Bible at our scripture reading. Revelation 17, verse 14. And, and I pray that by the end of this message that we will all be inspired to be as David's mighty men in these last days. And the Bible says in Revelation 17, verse 14, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Why am I emphasizing the word and? See, in the Greek, the word is kai. K-A-I would be the transliteration, kai. Um, and in the Greek, it carries with it what is called copulative and cumulative force. Now, cumulative means stacking, kind of like exponents in math. Um, copulative means joining together these coordinate words or groups of words which then adds expressing addition to their meaning. So it would be kind of like Ted is one man, James is one man, uh, Steve is one man. But when you say Ted and Steve and James, all of a sudden we have a group of men whose abilities have just exponentially increased. Um, so in the light of that, God has a people in these last days that he is saying they are called. Not only are they called, but they are chosen. Not only are they chosen, they are faithful. The Amplified Version puts it this way, they will wage war against the Lamb, that is Christ, and the Lamb will triumph and conquer them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are, are, um, those who are, with him are on his side, are the called and chosen, the elect and Faithful. You see, Genesis 3.15 puts it this way. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, Genesis 3.15 is not just the first promise of Calvary. It's not just the first promise, the nutshell version of the gospel. It's the first mention of the atonement. What is the atonement? What is the whole purpose of the atonement? It is to put enmity between us and Satan. And when that process is complete, then the time of trouble starts, and then after that, Jesus comes. 
But let's, let's examine each of these individual words, called, chosen, faithful. First, called. In the Greek, it does mean called, but it also means invited to. It means called to, divinely selected and appointed. And it means a saint. See, God's people that are with him when this war is finally won in its, in its finished state, the war was decided at Calvary, but it is not yet completed. But Revelation 17, 14 is telling us that, that the group that is with Jesus when this war is finally over are the saints. They are the divinely selected. They, they are the divinely appointed. They are the ones who are invited to the wedding feast. This word called is used 11 times in the New Testament. What does it mean, though? Okay, let's look at some texts that use these words. So in Matthew 22, we see the parable of a wedding feast. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. But notice, they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my, my fatted cattle are killed, and, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So what comes to your mind when you're hearing this story? Of course, Jesus told it back then, and they would have understood it in, uh, in, in the meanings that he had intended. Uh, but what comes to my mind when I'm reading this story is how throughout the Protestant Reformation, God had been calling his people to a deeper relationship with him. First, you had the Lutherans. And then you had the, the Lollards, and, and you had the, the Baptists and the Methodists, and all these people. And they came out when God had commanded them to, but eventually Christianity became stagnant. And so God once again tried in the mid-1800s, starting through a man named William Miller here in this country, and another man throughout the world as well. But um, since we're here in this country, we'll talk about this country. Um, and, and so... He, he was trying again, and, and, and God had been preaching through William Miller, come, for the, the wedding feast is ready. Come, let's get this over with, guys. Let's get this world of sin and sorrow done. And what did the, what did the denominations of America do? They made light of the message. They rejected it. They had character assassination towards those who were preaching it. And so God said, fine, you're not coming. The denominations, Babylon is fallen. That doesn't mean nobody from them can come. That means the denominations are fallen. They became part of Babylon. And so we'll notice what God says next. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And notice what he says next, for many are called, but few are chosen. See, everyone is called. Everyone is called to the wedding. Everyone is called to the feast. But why does he say everyone is called, but few are chosen? Is God calling everyone and only selectively choosing a few just arbitrarily? You see, the reality is most of us do not make the decision to put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. And this is a daily process that's got to happen every single day. And, and so the, because of that fact that, that most of us don't choose to put on Christ's righteousness, that is why. All of us are called, but only a few of us are chosen. Let's look at, um, from Mind, Character, Personality, Volume 2, page 620. It says, if you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death 
or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Manuscript releases, she says this, the character you bear in probationary time will be the character that you have at the coming of Christ. If you would be a saint in heaven here, she says it again, you must first be a saint on earth. So this, this group of people who had been invited to the, to the um, wedding here in Matthew 22, the, everyone but that one person had on the wedding garment. And, and so the, this, they had all accepted Christ's righteousness except for this one man. And then when the king came out to, to examine his guests, the word there actually is a direct reference to the investigative judgment to, to examine. Um, he found this one individual who didn't put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. And, and, and he said to them, how did you get in here? Why didn't you put on the robe that I gave you? And so here, what the Spirit of Prophecy is telling us in these quotes is that, look, it is here that we must put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. And that's not a once, once and done process. As, as, as we've already said a couple of times, it's a daily thing. It's a lifetime process. Sanctification is a lifetime process. You can't just say, Lord, forgive me, and then do whatever you want for the next 50 years and expect to go to heaven. You must first be a saint on earth. In other words, this is the preparatory time. The next word that Jesus described his people as is chosen. This word means picked out. It means chosen by God. It means elect or the favorite, the best of its kind or class. Have you, been, have you watched, those of you who have a TV at home, I don't have a TV, so I don't see any commercials, but those of you who have a TV and maybe have cable and you're watching uh, your favorite show and then they have commercials come on and they say, buy the new Mercedes, uh, what is it, M-Class, E-Class, whatever they are. It's the best of its kind. Now, and I, I used to be a valet and I drove some pretty nice cars. Um, and and, and I, one of the... One of my favorite cars I ever drove was the Audi A7. It was just a smooth ride, right? It, um, because to be honest, Mercedes didn't impress me much, but the Audi A7 was just a very comfortable ride. And and why do I mention that? Because Audi, the that A7 to me was the best of its kind. You see, in this generation, God is calling a people to be the best of its kind. God's standard of salvation has always been salvation through Christ alone leading up to perfect obedience to the law of God. That's what it's always been. But this generation is called to have an experience that no other generation has been called to. They are chosen to go through this experience. Chosen, the word, is used 23 times in the New Testament. So one of the uh, Instances is First Peter chapter two verse nine. But you are a chosen generation, or the best of its kind, the 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 favorite, the chosen. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So, is God choosing this people to the exclusion of all others? No, He's not. Because he wants all to be saved. He calls everyone. But we are to be uh, the royal priesthood, the peculiar people, a, a holy people for the purpose of sharing the gospel to the world. For the purpose of, of praising him who has called us out of darkness into his light. So another instance where this word is translated differently, but it is the same word, is Mark 13 verse 20. Unless the Lord had shortened those days... No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened those days. So God's people are the chosen elect. Now, this does not mean to say that, you know, it's God's people that he's chosen to be saved over here and this people over here that he's chosen to be lost. Because we've, we've seen from the Bible many times that God respects our freedom of choice. Elect simply means chosen, not once saved, always saved. In another instance, Luke 23, 35, the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him, sa let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the what? The chosen of God. This is the same word that is used in Revelation 17, 14. Uh, Peter, in 1 Peter 2, puts it 
this way, coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through faith, through Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was called this Greek word chosen, that's here in First Peter, for a reason. He was chosen by God. So to be chosen then, to be his elect, means to be Christ-like. Peter continues saying, Therefore it is also contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, there's that word again, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word, to, the wit, to which they also were appointed. So, for, for, for in this context, being chosen means to find Christ precious. The world finds Jesus to be a stumbling block because they love sin more than they love Jesus. The world doesn't love Jesus at all. But mo many Christians claim to love Jesus while they love their sin more. And that is why when some Christians hear certain things that are being presented, certain doctrines, certain truths, they, they, they stumble at them. The Sabbath, ah, that was done away with. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. Clean meats, nah, bring me the bacon. Bible, the Bible. And then they try to, to distort the Bible to support whatever it is they want to believe in. And, and Adventists are not immune from this. I hear Adventists say things, well, I'm simply not convicted on this yet. The Spirit's not told me to do that yet. And I've heard that one. I had an elder tell me, the Spirit told me to quit smoking, not the Bible. The Bible, the Holy Spirit's not going to say anything. The Bible doesn't. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. And so don't, don't, don't think that because you're here on Sabbath morning that you're immune from these excuses, that you're immune from stumbling at the truths of God's Word. The truth is we all have at one point and we're all going to at one point because we're not completely sanctified yet. What you need to answer in your own heart is, what sin am I still holding on to? What sin do I still love more than Jesus? And we all have one, or we'd have been translated by now. The Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 983, says it this way, As Christ was glorified on the day of Pentecost, so will he again be glorified in the closing work of the gospel, when he shall prepare a people to stand the final test in the closing conflict of the great controversy. And what is that final test? The great controversy tells us that it is to stand during the time of trouble without an intercessor. doesn't mean we're going to stand without Jesus, so don't take that out of context. We will absolutely still be relying 100% on Christ and Him crucified. Otherwise, we won't be able to make it. But it does mean that God's people have been purified completely by that point. They just won't realize it. And so they don't need the intercessor. I heard it. I was listening to the to the series on um, to uh, to a series by Secrets Unsealed, and um, the way one preacher put it was that sins are are kind of like the um, I don't remember the the exact word he used, but they're 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 kind of a stumbling block. They're they're the milestone. They're they're the point of contention between a uh, two parties. That is the reason they need a mediator. And when those are gone, you don't need the mediator anymore. Now, we will still need Jesus. Um, Review and Herald says it this way, the people of God are to be called out from their association with worldlings and evildoers to stand in the battle for the Lord against the powers of darkness. When the earth is lightened with the glory of God, we shall see a work similar to that which was wrought when the disciples filled with the Holy Spirit proclaimed the power of a risen Savior. See, Satan's accusation this whole time has been, you guys can't keep the law. And then Jesus came to prove that we can keep the law. And so Satan is saying, well, where are they? Where are those people? I haven't seen anybody do it. And then in this last generation, God is going to say, here are they. Here they are, that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Testimonies, volume 5, says this. She quotes Revelation 17, verse 14. Communion with Christ, how unspeakably precious. Such communion it is our privilege to enjoy if we will seek it, if we will make any sacrifice to secure it. When the early disciples heard the words of Christ, they felt their need of him. Do you feel your need of Jesus when you read his words? 
make any sacrifice to secure it. Um, they sought, they found, they followed him. They, they were with him in the house, at the table, in the closet, in the field. They, they were with him as pupils with a teacher, daily receiving from his lips lessons of holy truth. They looked to him as servants to their master to learn their duty. They served him cheerfully and gladly. They followed him as soldiers follow their commander, fighting the good fight of faith. And here she quotes, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And don't think that the disciples had an advantage that we don't. While they had Jesus physically there in person with him, we have him here through the Holy Spirit, which, in my opinion, is much more powerful. After all, Jesus said, blessed are those who have seen, who have not seen, and yet believe. Jesus has also called us to be faithful. His people in Revelation 17, 14 are described as faithful. Not just called and chosen, but faithful. Now this word is used 67 times in the New Testament. It's used quite often. It means trusty, faithful, worthy of trust, one that can be relied on. Confiding, uh, one who has become convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and author of salvation. Now this particular one stands out to me. One that can be relied on. What on earth would God need to rely on us for? God is all-powerful. What does he need us for? Well, we'll get to that. But where is this, is this word found? Let's read in Matthew chapter 24. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord hath, what hour your Lord doth come. He's speaking. Remember Matthew 24, the disciples asked, when are you coming back? How are we going to know? Um, but know this, that if the good men of the house had known in that in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. Who then is a faithful, there's the word, and wise servant whom his Lord hath made uh, ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. In Matthew 25, this is uh, the 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 wise virgins, the sheep and the goats, those stories. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Uh, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. So being faithful here is connected with using what God has given us, whether that be finances, talents, uh, the talent of speech, the talent of compassion, evangelism, everything God has given us. When we are faithful with it, he multiplies it. But notice Jesus' contrast here. This is what it means to be faithful. What does it mean to be unfaithful? Then he which had received the one, the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. Are God's expectations high? Absolutely. But he gives us the power to, to meet those expectations. I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid. And I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, here thou hast that is thine. There are many people who hear that God's standard is high and they're afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they're looking to themselves for salvation and not to Jesus. There are many people who hear this message and they say things like, well, you're being legalistic. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to worry about sanctification or any of that other stuff. And I say to that, hogwash. The Bible says God's goal for us is complete and total sanctification. It says his goal for us is to, to remove sin from us completely so that he can take us to heaven. And we rely completely on Jesus for that purpose. And, and, and this man here represents all those who are afraid of this message. They're afraid of this message of preparation, my friends. You may have noticed um, a theme throughout all the sermons I have been preaching here, and that is preparation. It has become the burden of the ministry that I believe the Lord has given me. I want to see God's people prepared for what is coming. What happens if... Uh, if a student comes up to his final test and he has not studied. And I'm not talking about that anomaly of a student who never has to study. I'm talking about the students who, who have to actually work hard. You know, there were some subjects I could just listen to the teacher and ace the test. But there were some subjects I couldn't do that, like physics. 
I enjoyed physics, but it was hard. What happens if we come up to those tests, like, you know, the physics final, and you've not studied, you've not done the homework, are you going to pass that test? Absolutely not. Unless you're an abnormal genius. They do exist. But, you know, our, if, if we don't pass this test that God has given us on the day-to-day -day walk, then when we come up to the final test, when the Sunday law is imposed, and you're not allowed to buy or sell, are you going to pass? That's a question you're going to have to answer on your own through prayer with Jesus. And then if you pass that test, then are you going to pass the second test that says if you don't keep Sunday, you're going to, you're going to die? Are you going to pass that one? Again, that's something you have to answer between you and the Lord. Luke 12 talks about uh, a group of servants. Let your loins be girded about. This is Luke 12, starting in verse 35. And your lights burning, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this now that if the goodman of the house had known that the hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not, would not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore also ready, or ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. And a couple of verses later, Jesus uses that word. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Now, I did a sermon on this last year, um, but we're just going to review a little bit. What is a faithful servant? Well, the faithful servant, their waists are guarded with truth. Their lamps are burning uh, or, or, or lit. You know, it would be like a flashlight that's on. They wait. And this is an action word. Wait, not passively waiting, but actively waiting. Involved in ministry. They open the door for the bridegroom when he comes. They're watching for the bridegroom. They're blessed if they're found watching when he returns. They, they don't allow their houses or their, their hearts to be broken into. And by contrast, what is an unfaithful servant? Well, Jesus really isn't coming soon. If you continue reading in Luke 12, verse 45, they have the attitude, well, Jesus really isn't coming soon. Sadly, there are many within the world church that say that. They beat and mistreat their fellow servants. And and there are parts of the world where there still very much is physical persecution, where people are martyred for their faith, even now in 2022. But it doesn't necessarily just refer to that. Are you mocking the messengers that God sends to you? Are you mocking the message? Remember, the Bible, one of the things the Bible says to us is that um, you, you might be mocking the messenger, but truthfully, it's not them that your problem is with, it's with God. The example brought this morning was that the Israel murmured against Moses. We said that in Sabbath school, but they, were they really murmuring against Moses? Who were they really murmuring against? Against God, because Moses was simply the servant of God. He was simply a willing vessel. Moses wasn't really the one who led Israel out of Egypt. It was God. Moses was significant, don't get me wrong, but he was a servant. He wasn't God. They're gluttonous. Now, this doesn't necessarily refer to just food, although, yes, it does we have been given a health message. But are we being gluttonous with our minds, right? What do I mean by that? Are we putting things in our minds that don't belong there? Are we spending more time in Netflix than with Jesus? Are we spending more time watching primetime TV or YouTube than Jesus? They, they, they drink the wine of Babylon. They get drunk off the wine of Babylon. How many Adventists do you know who are going to these empty, broken vessels that I believe it's Jeremiah 2 mentions, expecting to become spiritually healthy by reading those who don't know the truth? Now, there are nuggets here and there, don't get me wrong. But, but what's the point in reading a book from T.D. Jakes when we have the spirit of prophecy? T.D. Jakes, in my opinion, is a known false teacher, and I don't say that lightly. I'm talking about false teachers, popular false teachers, who reject the truth, right? Um, these people are also not watching 
and looking for Jesus to return. They're not preparing. See, they knew God's will, and they didn't do it. This word is also translated as true in 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So faithful people are also connected with being honest. So how important is honesty in the Bible? Well, strict integrity. What happened to Achan when he refused to come forth and be honest? He and his whole family were swallowed up. They, they, were, they, 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 they got the death penalty. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 309, says an intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the sky is green. It doesn't have to be blatant falsehood. By a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, an expression of the countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectually as by words. All intentional overstatement, every hint or insinuation, and calculated to convey an erroneous or exaggerated impression. Even the statement of facts in such a manner as to mislead is falsehood. And so God's, uh, God's desire for honesty in our lives, uh, notice the way that Revelation 14 puts it. It's a, it's a very intense, passionate desire that God has. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And in their mouth was found no guile. No guile, no dishonesty, no, no deceptiveness, no gossip, none of that. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, in our, as we said, the, the, the word for faithful also means true. Now, in this particular instance, the word mouth is interesting. It means, it does refer to the mouth, but it also refers to, to, to the language and its relations to the face. Since your mouth is in your face, or your, the thoughts of your soul, since um, we express our thoughts through our mouths, through our speech. And so, the remember Jesus said, through the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Guile, interesting here, it means tr a trick or uh, wile, craft, deceit, subtlety. It means to entrap, to delude, or to beguile by uh, blandishments to entice or deceive. So, so God's people, of all the characteristics God could point out in Revelation 14, verse 5, he chooses describing his people as being without guile. Because if we're honest with ourselves, if we're honest with God, then everything else is going to come in tow. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, says it this way, if we would have the image and superscription of God upon us, we must separate ourselves from all iniquity. It goes on to say, why were they so specially singled out, this, this group, these, these, the 144,000? Because they had to stand with a wonderful truth right before the whole world and receive their opposition. And while receiving their opposition, they were to remember that they were the sons and daughters of God, that they must have Christ formed within them, the hope of glory. Now, there's one particular story that comes, that, that comes to my mind when I read this quote, and that is when Jesus was on trial before the Pharisees and Sadducees, particularly Caiaphas. And do you remember how they treated him? What did they do to him? They spit on him. They beat him. They whipped him. They mocked him. And if you read The Desire of Ages, this, this particular experience was, was particularly difficult for Jesus, particularly painful for him. Why? Not necessarily because of the abuse, not necessarily because of the physical pain, but he knew who he was, right? He knew he was God. He knew that all he had to do was, with a glance of the eye, he could turn them all to dust. The Desire of Ages specifically says that. And because he knew he had that power, it made it particularly difficult for him. He said, like, you know what, I, I could just poof, be gone, and this would be over. And, but, but if he would have done that, Satan would have won the controversy because Jesus would have used an advantage available to him that was not available to us. Can I, with the glance of an eye, turn this half of the sanctuary to dust? No, I can't. I don't have that power. Jesus didn't use any advantage that was not available to us. And that was the whole purpose of that trial. All the trials that we call are called to put on top of each other and exponentially increased could not even approach the, the, the magnanimity to which Jesus experienced in his trials. It just, because Satan knew that if he could conquer him, he conquered us. So, 
what are we as the called and chosen to do? And what do these have to do with faithfulness? You see, if we are finally going to be found faithful in the end, we must first have been chosen. And in order to be chosen, we must first be called. And then if we experience these things, they, when, when we add them together, remember, they, they, they multiply the, the, the meaning and the power. You see, to overcome means to, to, to carry off the victory. It means to, to win the case. This whole great controversy is one, one long 6,000-year uh, legal battle. Uh, it's really what it is at its foundation. When you read in Revelation 12, in, in the Greek, uh, there was war in heaven. It's talking about a war of words in the Greek. Um, and so th this whole thing is an accusation against God by Satan. And God has called us to help him win the case. In Revelation 14 in the three angels' messages, the Bible says, uh, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of water. So what are the called and chosen called to do? We are called to fear God, which means to obey his law. We are called to give him glory, which means to, to live healthy, to spread the gospel. And this is by no, this is by no means an exhaustive list. You, I'm sure you could, guys could think of hundreds of things more to add. We are called to worship him, which in this context means to keep the true Sabbath because um, this last sentence here is a direct quote from the fourth commandment. In, in the second angel's message, what does is, what is being called, chosen, and faithful have to do with that? There followed another angel saying, Babylon is uh, fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 18 echoes this. It echoes a second angel by saying, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Come out of who? Come out of Babylon. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God doesn't want anybody to receive the plagues that are going to fall on Babylon. And so he calls, he calls us all out. And why? For her sins have reached unto heaven. And God has remembered her iniquity. So what are, in this context, what are we called to do? We have to come out of Babylon. God is calling us to come out of Babylon physically, but also mentally and spiritually. We are to separate our minds and hearts from Babylon. You might be sitting physically in an Adventist church, but your mind may very well be, still be a part of Babylon. As Christian Bardal says, uh, um, you know, he's an Adventist uh, ministry that does stuff on, a lot of stuff on music. He, he coined a term he calls a Babylistian. Are you a Babylistian? Are you somebody who has chosen two masters? God calls us to choose one master, either one or the other. He wants us to choose him, but he respects our freedom of choice. And another thing that we are called to do is to expose the sins of Babylon. Are we to expose them for the purpose of laughing at them? No, but we are to expose the sins of Babylon for the purpose of showing people the, the heinous character of what Babylon really is. Some people, uh, many people, can be convinced that, 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 that the Antichrist really is the Antichrist and that Babylon is a false religion when we point out the things that she has done, the crimes that she has committed for all of history. In the third angel's message, we read that if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his uh, forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast or his image, and, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. And here's the contrast. Here is the patience of the saints. From Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, we are called and chosen to avoid the mark of the beast. God doesn't tell us the warnings of the third angel's message to scare us. He doesn't tell us those warnings to, to manipulate us into the kingdom of heaven. He says, look, you guys have a choice to make. Do you want to be identified with the first angel and spread the gospel to the world, or do you want to be identified with the wicked in the third angel's message 
who, who will receive the wrath of God? Or do you want to be those who keep the commandments of God, which is what we're called to do, and to keep the faith of Jesus, and to receive the seal of God? You see, you must be called before you are chosen. You must be chosen before you become faithful. And you must be all three in order to overcome. Have you ever tried to make a dish and forgot ingredients or accidentally swapped ingredients for something else? I remember when I was a kid, one of my favorite drinks was Kool-Aid back in the 80s and 90s. And um, what do you need to make Kool-Aid? It's really easy. You need sugar and the flavor packet and water. And uh, of course, water. <laughs> Minor detail. Um, but I remember one particular instance, we wanted some Kool-Aid, so we made some Kool-Aid, only we didn't realize we swapped sugar for salt. It was nasty. Yeah, it, was, it was very bitter water, very bitter flavored water. Um, maybe you've tried to make a cake, and you, maybe you swapped out something for something else that shouldn't have been in there, or you forgot an ingredient. Um, you know, or, or you're in the process of cooking and you're trying to make some really tasty burgers or something and you're, oh, I forgot the salt. Salt is a flavor enhancer. And so it's, really, it's good to add a little bit of salt to most of our recipes because it enhances the flavor. Even a little bit of sugar, they're not bad things. They're flavor enhancers. But if you forget a key ingredient, can, can you make um, a black bean burger without the black beans? Can you make chocolate ice cream without the chocolate? Can can you be saved in your sin? No. Jesus came to save us from our sins, not in them. You see, there is a recipe for victory here. If we want to be faithful, we've got to be chosen. If we want to be chosen, we've got to be called. And God's called everyone, so he's made the start easy. It is then up to us once we are called, if we are chosen. And it is up to us working in conjunction with God, God's power, and still our choice if we're going to end up being faithful. We need all three of these to overcome. And you see, um, just as you can't, just as, 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 as my Kool-Aid was messed up because I put the wrong ingredients in, our Christian experience will be messed up if we put in the wrong ingredients. I really like Revelation 17, 14 in the Good News translation. I don't. I'd, I'd like to do translation comparison, and I don't often go to translations like this because I feel like they water a lot of it down, but this particular text I find very powerful in this version. They will fight against the Lamb. These are the Antichrist, the powers of the world, the powers of wickedness, demons, whatnot. They will fight against the Lamb, but, some of the most powerful words in Scripture are but God, but the Lamb, together with his called, chosen, and faithful followers, will defeat them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Remember how I mentioned, what does God need us for? What could God possibly need from us? We're sinners, we're broken, we're evil. What does God need? Well, we're in a great controversy. We're in a legal battle. I'm sure you've heard stories of divorced couples who are going to court, and one of them Maybe the husband was slandering the wife, and the, or the wife was slandering the husband, or should I say ex-wife and ex-husband. Um, and they needed to clear their name in order to accomplish certain things. God, uh, sorry, Satan has accused God of something. What has Satan accused God of? That his law is unfair. That, that humanity in their sin cannot possibly obey perfectly. And then Jesus came. Jesus showed that, yes, we can. As long as we keep our eyes focused on him and the Father and live through the Holy Spirit. What does Paul say? Walk in the Spirit and you shall what? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And Jesus showed that is true. And Satan says, well, fine, that's Jesus. What about them? They can't do it. Why did God not end the great controversy when Jesus died? Because, after all, the angels were then convinced all the unfallen worlds were then convinced. What was left to accomplish? Us. We did not yet understand. Even the apostles did not yet understand. Those who walked daily with Jesus in his physical presence still did not understand. Humanity, 2,000 years later of Bible study, 
still does not understand. And so God has called a group of people, do you want to help me prove Satan wrong? God needs to clear his name. Because you see, if God leaves any part of his character under question, sin will have opportunity to rise up again. And Nahum verse 1-9 says that sin shall not rise a second time. So in order to do that, God has to follow a very particular set of actions. And so God needs us to help him with that. He wants to prove Satan wrong once and for all to us. There's a book called The Sanctuary Service by Elder M. L. Andreasen. He died, I think, in the 60s. He was born in the late 1800s. He actually was personal friends with Ellen White. And he says it this way, Sanctuary Service, page 302. And by the way, you can order a hard copy of this book, but you can also get a free PDF uh, on a certain website, and I'll be happy to send that to anybody who wants it. He says this, page 302 and 303 of his book, Thus it shall be with the last generation of men living on the earth. Through them, God's final demonstration of what he can do with humanity will be given. He will take the weakest of the weak, those bearing the sins of their forefathers, and in them show the power of God. Jesus came when humanity was weakened by 4,000 years of sins, and God is going to do a special work through humanity who has been weakened by 6,000 years of sin. What is that work? They will be subjected to every temptation, but they will not yield. They will demonstrate that it is possible to live without sin. The very demonstration for which the world has been looking and for which God has been preparing. It will become evident to all that the gospel really can save to the uttermost. That God really is found true in his sayings. He continues, It is in the last generation of men living on the earth that God's power into sanctification will stand fully revealed. The demonstration of that power is God's vindication. It clears him of any and all charges which Satan has placed against him. In the last generation, God is vindicated and Satan is defeated. This uh, may need some further amplification, and he goes on to explain things much more further. It's a long chapter in this book. Um, Isaiah 43 puts it this way, and, and, and we're almost done. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. And what is glory? Character. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, there's an enemy. You guys are going to help me. I want you guys to help me. He has accused me of things that are not true, and I want you guys to help me. And they chose Satan, sadly enough. They didn't pass the test. Abraham, Noah, all these people had issues where they failed at one point or another but God brought them back. And in this last generation, um, God has, has said, I'm going to use you guys to help clear my character, to help clear my name. I'm gonna call, I have called you by name for that purpose, he says. I have created you for my character. In closing, one of, my, one of the probably most well-known quotes on this subject from Christ Object Lessons, page 69. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire, intense passion, for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. You see, when we claim the name of Christ, but we do not claim his power to overcome, I dare say that is a false and even blasphemous gospel. See, we can hasten the second coming. Do, do, do you realize that? The power is in our hands. We can hasten the second coming. In, I listened to a sermon, again, from Secrets and Sealed, specifically by uh, Elder Dennis Preeby, wonderful speaker. Um, 
and he talked about a period of church that he uh, of church history between 1888 and 1893. The sermon was called Five Years to the Gates of Heaven. And he says, during that time, we were closer to the gates of heaven than we have ever been in church history because God was preparing his church. God was giving us wonderful manifestations of his power. He was bringing people together. He was revealing his truth to us in powerful ways. And, and, and what happened? People started mocking the message. People said, you don't really have to overcome. We don't need to live righteousness by faith, as these fanatics are, are saying. And who were those fanatics? Specifically, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Now, they were calling them fanatics. I I'm, I'm, I'm promise you, I'm not calling them fanatics. These were men, the spirit of prophecy specifically said, were called by God and sent with the heaven-born message of righteousness by faith. And the church rejected it. And here we are, 140, nearly 150 years later, still here. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us we may have to remain in this world many more years because of insubordination. But we should not lay sin to sin, she says, by charging God with the fault. Many people say that we cannot overcome. They say that, that, that it's not possible. Folks, that's blaming God. Because why would God tell us to overcome if it wasn't possible? And so, by our actions, either by continuing to reject righteousness by faith, we can put off the coming of Christ for many more years. And, and many of us will be, could be long dead before Jesus comes again. Or, we can get our acts together. We can say, Lord, I am sick of sin and Satan. I am sick of stumbling in this area so many times. Lord, please give me victory. And I don't mean to pray like, Lord, please, can you, can you, maybe, can you maybe help me not eat so much? Lord, help me. I need your power. I need it now, Lord. Please give me this power to overcome. We have to pray with an intense passion that we have not yet known. Even if you've been walking for the, with the Lord for the past 70-plus uh, years, we must have that, that, that intense passion to overcome sin as we have never before experienced. And, and because God has commanded it, he has made it possible. Folks, I, I want to see us all there. I want to see us prepare. And I want to see us all sharing the message of preparation. 